So in this episode, we're going to look at these sensors. These actually measure pulse and oxygen levels. They may look identical, but they're not. Let's find out what the differences are and how we could use them with our Arduino. Roll the titles. Is that it? <sighs> so let's see what the physical differences are. If we examine the circuit boards on these, you know, zoom in as well. If you look at the tracks and everything, and the components, they are identical. You may notice a subtle difference in this, the main sensor device here, compared to this one. As you can see, it's a little glass window, and there's a little glass window there, and there and these. But apart from that, the components are identical. The circuit traces on the back are the same. So what makes one different to the other. Well, if you look at the actual text that's on them, one says it's a MAX 30100, and if I turn that the right way up, it was the right way up, sorry, and if you look at the text on this one, it says very smallly, MAX 30102. I had a look at the data sheets, the specs are virtually identical. There are some subtle differences in the specs but nothing that would remake a dramatic change whatever project you were doing. The main difference I could see when going through the spec sheet was that the 302, on this one, has a slightly bigger buffer for storing data. And it's the buffer you use to extract the information from these devices. These are I squared C devices. There's quite a lot of connections on, you can see. These came with their, the pin edits for them to solder on as well. But they are I squared C, and they are, the way you use them, you've got to read from an internal buffer. And on the 30100 one, 30100 version, it's got a 16 byte buffer. And on the 30, the 102 version, 30102 version, it's got a 32 byte buffer. In everyday use, from what I can think we'd be using them for, I don't think that make an awful lot of difference. Now, there is a problem with these. I was doing some research. I mean, I quickly, I was. When I say quickly ordered them, one day I was sort of just typing the word sensor and on and, you know an Arduino and seeing what comes up, so what I haven't used before. And this was probably around about oh I don't know two or three months ago. And these came up, blood and oxygen sensors at sensors. I thought that sounds great. I have a bit of that. I've been to the hospital quite a few times in the last uh, year or so. And then little things you put on your fingers, like little slots on, measures your oxygen and pulse and what have you. And I was fascinated at how they work. Because if you watch my other videos, I've done uh, a few now on those basic heart sensors, and they are a bit flaky. They're not fantastically reliable on this. You know, the sensitivity is a bit up and down. You're not exactly still and various things. So and also, so I thought these might be better. And also, I thought that yeah, oxygen as well. That'd be fantastic. So I could well, yeah, they look good. I ordered them. They weren't a lot of money. They were about the cost of a cheapish cup of coffee, a cup of coffee, a couple of chocolate bars each. And yeah, doing a bit of research for this video uh, a couple of days ago, I discovered that these are a little bit tricky to use. There is another one you can buy that interfaces to an Arduino very easily, and I've actually ordered one of those, so I'll do another video on that in the future when that arrives. These can be used with an Arduino, but you've got to make a slight alteration to the circuit board. Basically, these three resistors here, have to go. It's because this is basically a 1.8 volt chips. Obviously our Arduinos are 5 volts. There is a regulator on board that reduces it down from 5 volts to the correct voltage. However, the R squared C bus on these is still operating at 1.8 volts. And just with that slight adjustment of taking these resistors out, we can actually make it talk to our Arduino. So it's not a biggie. I mean, most of us will have a soldering iron. It's just that they are surface mount and very tiny. But I'll go through taking them off as I do. I'm basically just going to apply some heat and give it a bit of a poke, and it should just come off. So let's move on, and I'll solder these up, and we'll connect them to our Arduino. I've got a bit of solder wick and my handy tweezers to try and pull away. May not need them. We'll see. Let's just have a go. Now, it's a really awkward angle for me. I've got a camera. I've got a magnifying glass, and I'm trying to get my hands in and actually desolder these. 
as best as I can. Let's just clean that tip a little bit. And okay, let's have a go with this one I think first. Get the, the wick. Just drag up some soda. Will be the plan. Yeah, I've definitely got a little bit up there. I just very very awkward trying to shoot this with a camera. Go on. And so I mean all that struggle that I'm doing, slightly not the camera, it went off. The camera does have some sort of issue where it will go off and the slightest touch needs replacing. And let's see if we can get this. Really, I'm at the wrong angle here. Let's see if we can just get in this way. I think what I'm going to have to do, I'm going to have to cut my losses. You can see what you have to do, but I'm going to have to do this off camera. I just haven't got the room and maneuverability to actually do this with everything around. But that's what you need to do. I'll go do it off camera and we'll come back to it. So there we are, all removed. It was really easy. It was around about 30 seconds to a one minute job. Extremely easy when you've not got all the camera and equipment around you to actually do. All I did is heated up one side of the uh, resistor, the solder melted, just had my tweezers on, then heated the top of the resistor and just eased and it just pulled off and it took between 10 and 15 seconds each one if that. So it was all done really quickly. So don't be afraid, you've got a solder nine, that was a really easy job to remove them. Let's move on to actually building onto the circuit board. So here we are, all mounted up on the board. It's an R2C device, as I've mentioned before, but you can see that I've connected, obviously, the voltage, the 5 volts of the Arduino to the 5 volt rail here, and the ground to the ground rail. And then on this device, we've got the VI in, so that's gone straight to the positive rail, and we've got the ground straight to the ground rail. No real surprises there. We then have the normal uh, normal R squared C connections on the Arduino the data is on A4 so that's gone to the SDA connection and the clock is on A5 and that's gone to the clock connection we then have an, we then have an INT connection which goes down to D2 this is a requirement of these the, the, the driver library and of, and of this device as well now as you remember we took off those 4K7 resistors there and we've actually replaced them with three 4K7 resistors there. If you can see, I've got one connected to the data, to the clock, to the D2 line, to this INT connection here. Notice these two connections, you can just leave them unconnected. So why did we go to the trouble of desoldering three 4K7 resistors off the board, only to put them externally there? The reason is the Arduino is a 5 volt device and it talks to devices and expects devices to talk with 0 or 5 volts on this data line for it to understand what the data is. This device, this board, these were pulling up the I squared C lines to 1.8 volts because this device runs on 1.8 volts and it's got an internal regulator. Uh, to actually generate that 1.8 volts, and it will pull it up to 1.8. Now, the way this R squared C device works, it pulls any voltage down to zero to give a zero, which is fine, but to give a, a high, a one value, it just lets it float to whatever these resistors pull it up to. So that would pull it up. So if it says I want it to send a high, a one digital pulse down this data line, it will just let it float high and those internal resistors there would have just taken it up to 1.8 volts, which the Arduino just cannot read as a high value. So the data will be corrupted and garbled. So that's the reason we have to take them off. But we still need that high value, so this will pull it down to a zero for zeros. But when, it's, when it wants a high value of one, it just lets it float. So we need to float it back up. So we need to float the R squared C back up to 5 volts. So the Arduino can see it as a, a 5 volts, so, you know, a, a digital value of one. When this, they, when this basically says just let it float up and it will then pull it down to zero when it needs a zero pulls it across. So that's why we have to go through this bit of a palaver. I mean when I say palaver, it was fairly simple. It took me about a minute or so and I said to, to take them off. Anybody with a solar iron can do it. Just apply a bit of the heat and they just pop straight off. It was easy. And you can see it was dead easy to do this. I just, just each one just gets pulled up to five volts there and that is it. Very simple circuit. So let's have a look at what you need to drive this and we'll have some look at the default examples that come with it. So to load up the libraries, 
for this actual device, go to Sketch, Include Library and Manage Libraries and then we're going to filter your search, type in 30100 and you get two libraries up. This one I think is by SparkFun, not this one sorry, this one at the top is by SparkFun. Couldn't get that one to work, it doesn't seem to want to use the D2 pin, that INT pin and yeah it just wouldn't work. So the one I find that works is this one Max 30100 Lib, click on that and then click install. You can see I've already done that, that's already installed but you just click install and away you go. So we go to sketch So I've got sketch file and examples and go down here and it's somewhere around, it's gone past the to there it is the 30100 lib, 3100 lib and the one I've seen to be the most easier to use is this one where it says underscore minimal select that and we'll just maximise this I'm not going to say how this code works, it's not my example but it basically is going to bring back in the main loop and display a heart rate in BPM and it's going to display your blood oxygen level as a percentage. So you would upload that to your board. I've already done that. So it's going to my board and we'll power it up. Oh, so you need your serial monitor open. So I'll go to tools and serial monitor. There we go. So it's initializing it. And then it's got heart rate. And it's, because I've not got my finger on it, it's got heart rate of zero. And my blood oxygen level of zero as well. So I'm just going to pop a finger on it. Let's just face it like that and put my finger on it and just let it settle down so my heart rate is around 80 which is average for me and with a blood oxygen level of 96 stroke 97 coming out there which is actually I was in hospital fairly recently and uh, yeah I was about around about 97 or so for my blood oxygen level now like the other sensor I've used for heartbeat they can fluctuate a bit if you move your finger but this one Although it might look like it's been a bit sensitive there, um, it is not as bad as the other sensor. So if I pressed, if I move my finger now, gently rock it, I am doing, but you can still see it's around about 70s and 80s and so. Whereas, I mean, you might not see it moving my finger, but this might move I'm doing now on the sensor will send the other one absolutely do lally. And that's a word you don't hear very often, but it is well used for this situation because on the other sense of this, it's incredibly sensitive to movement. This one is actually not as sensitive. Uh, even rocking it backwards and forwards, which I am doing, not as bad. Perhaps a little bit there. But generally, this is not as bad or as sensitive as a sensor as those cheaper ones where it has a little heart symbol on it, it's that little round thing. And if I apply more pressure, it does fluctuate for a second or two. But then generally, it settles down, so you can't see this happening, I promise, I am actually applying more pressure down the finger in a second, I'll do it now. So I'm actually pressing quite firmly on this sensor now, and then we'll let it settle, so oxygen levels down at 96, heartbeat around 67, 73, 77, is about correct. And I'm pressing quite firmly, this leads me to believe that this one, because you can press firmly on the other one, it just died, it just wouldn't work properly. This leads me to believe that you could, just take my finger off for a second, that you could probably take this off the board, have it in some sort of velcro strap, and strap it to your finger where the pressure will be constant and actually it won't move very much. So you could get a decent reading out to build yourself a finger sensor with that. And that is something I'm going to do. This is just a basic introduction to the sensor. I'm going to work on another project where it will be strapped to my finger. And I'm going to press quite firmly down again with my finger and then let it settle. And it's hard to me to keep the pressure exactly the same, but a Velcro strap would actually do it spot on. I can see it as it is doing a steady reading. I'm pressing quite firmly. The other sensors would just collapse at this point and give you absolutely pathetic results. Rubbish. But this one doesn't, so I'm quite impressed with it. This is the 30100 one. The 31 or 2, as I mentioned, basically there's a bigger buffer in it, so you could easily just put the 30. Uh, one or two in there and it will be no problem, it will work exactly the same. So yeah, so in a later project we're going to actually take this off here, mount it on my finger and I'm also going to do a little display, not like the old sort of like, uh, the one you've seen on the previous projects for the heartbeat monitors where it's a little, little oil LED display, I think we're going a bit more, a bit more high tech with the next project on this. That might be another couple of weeks away, I've got another couple of videos I might want to put out in the meantime. 
But until now, if you've liked that, if it's given you a bit of introduction to using this sensor, it's not hard. They do need a bit of faffing to take them and resistors off, but it, it really was not hard. Well worth doing. As I said, I've ordered one that that's, um, doesn't even have those resistors on. It can actually just hook up to the I2C device without having to bother desoldering resistors. So you might want to hold out for that. When it turns up, I'll sort of do a video on that and show you how simple it's compared to this. And you'd probably be able to use either with the software I'm going to write for the new module I'm doing, for the new um, project that I'm doing. But that's it for now. Hopefully you've liked that. And if you did, you know, give it that sort of like thumbs up. That really helps. Uh, comment down below if you want to actually say something. Uh, share if you want to. Really appreciate it. Uh, there'll be links coming up to subscribe. Make sure you do that if you want to. And there'll be like a Patreon link as well. If you feel like patronizing patronizing me, patronizing, whatever you want to do. If you feel like doing it, go ahead. If not, I enjoy you watching. Really, thanks for watching. Thanks very much, and I'll see you next time. So if you like that video, hit that like button. If you want to see more, hit that subscribe button. And the notification bell, make sure you get all the videos. And if you're that kind of sharing person, hit that sharing button. For a bit of laziness, if you want to subscribe, look at the arrow, click on that icon, and it'll subscribe you. I haven't even scrolled down or anything like that. Is that it for this outro now? Yeah, I think so. Good.